36. Oops. Um, I have to, well, uh, in 1836, these were codified um, in uh, Horace Mann's effort to establish the State Board of Education. Now, sadly, the advances of white family that white families were able to experience were not matched by those in the black community. There was a glimmer of hope when the Freedmen schools were established after the Civil War, but the crushing of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, kept blacks from quality education. And these inequities continue to the present day, as Pr Prof. Rooks will describe in the opening talk. Uh, in my own high school days at Brooklyn's James Madison High School, I still remember the angst over the dreaded New York State Regents exam. Later, as a parent of children who were the first to take the MCAS exam, uh, we experienced our third grader coming home deeply upset, having heard that his teachers would be fired uh, and he wouldn't be able to go to college because of the MCAS uh, exams. Jackie and I watched drill and kill mentality drive creative teaching uh, and teachers out of, out of the classroom. You'll hear uh, some of this directly from Kathy Greeley later on in the conference. Uh, the investigations of our parent teacher association organization revealed clearly that the program was driven by right-wing forces like the Pioneer Institute and were an effort to dumb down public education. Sadly, the bur burden of high stakes testing has fallen disproportionately on black and brown students. Lose a film shows some of that. Now, the campaign in Massachusetts, the current campaign for limiting MCAS as a graduation requirement, uh, the opt-out campaign, uh, opt-out campaign in New York State, and Rep. Bauman's bill in the U.S. Congress, these open up new fronts for fighting back to defend and promote quality education. Now, a number of people have mentioned to me that it seemed odd to have a public education conference sponsored by Mass Peace Action or the Mass Peace Action Education Fund. In fact, as far, part of our fund people, not the Pentagon, we are sharply aware of how the bloated Pentagon budget draws tax dollars away from essential human needs, healthcare, public education, housing, public transit, environmental protection, and supporting battles for public education is a core tactic of our Books Not Bombs campaign. Our opening panelist, Prof. Rooks, Chair of Africana Studies at Brown University and the author of Cutting School, Privatization, Segregation, and the End of Public Education, an excellent book. Uh, she'll be followed by uh, Professor Carolyn Crockett on the MIT Faculty of History, Public Policy, and Urban Planning. Carolyn has studied urban life and transportation in Boston. She, she previously served as the Director of Economic Policy and Research and Director of Small Business Development for the City of Boston. Dan French, the third speaker in the opening plenary, is president of the Citizens for Public School, uh, uh, leading the leading Massachusetts advocate for public education. Uh, Dan was formerly employed at the State Department of Education and has been a longtime critic of high stakes testing since its inception in Massachusetts. Now, unfortunately, Professor Rooks couldn't be here in person, but wanting to address these issues to us, uh, she has sent a, a video. So, Glenn, if you'd please run it. Thank you for joining. My name is Noliwe Rooks, and I'm the chair of Africana Studies at Brown University. Um, thank you for joining to hear my talk today. There were clouds obscuring the sky in Topeka, Kansas that day. The air warmed by rising sun collided with that cooled by the rapidly setting moon. The result was that mist hung and hovered on the morning of May 17, 1954. This was the day that the Supreme Court was to announce its decision in the Brown v. Board of Education case. Inside homes and businesses, Black and white people in the town, whose Board of Education was a named defendant in the case, awaited news about whether or not schools segregated by race in the United States were legal. The ruling was a test of the strength of democracy as protection for people who were not wealthy or white. One thing I did not know until recently is that beginning in the 1940s, Black people in Topeka fought hard against having to integrate their Black school system with the white one in town. 
Topeka's was a district that was equally funded. Uh, the educations of black and white children received the same amount of money. Black teachers and administrators were paid the same as those who were white, and black children sat in school buildings as sturdy, well heated, and cool as any in any school in any town. Books and materials were in good shape and purchased new for black children. Black people were proud of the educations their children received in Topeka, and 54% who were polled in the weeks leading up to the ruling said they preferred things just as they were. They didn't see the point in sending their children to white schools where they weren't sure they would be wanted. If promises have ingredients, trust, faith, and hope are most assuredly among those most often stirred and mixed. These parents did not trust in the promise that white teachers and administrators would accept their children. They had no faith that now, just because there was a law requiring it, public education would train black hands and minds and inspire dreams in the same ways white children had always taken for granted. The majority of black parents were unsure their babies could grow tall and strong, secure in the knowledge that they had access to taxpayer supported opportunity. The rest of the people in town did not so much believe that white schools were better for their children. They just understood that opportunity and access to corporate boardrooms, halls of political power and generational wealth lay on the other side of classroom doors where rich and powerful white parents sent their children. Both groups, as it turned out, were right. As that day progressed and sun banished fog and clouds played hide and seek with sky, the town learned that the judicial branch of the federal government had struck down legalized segregation of schools based on race and declared it wrong that a black child should have to walk six blocks to her school bus stop, board a bus, and then ride a mile to her segregated black school, despite the fact that a white school was a mere seven blocks from her home. This was, this ruling was, many said, a victory. But as days and then weeks passed, the reality dawned in Topeka and across much of the South that the battle for the education of Black children was not a thing to be easily given, no matter the law. A 12-year-old little girl named Mary, who lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, wrote an autobiography decades later that included her memories of the day the Brown decision was announced. Fearing white rage, teachers let Mary and other Black children out of school hours before the regular end of the school day. The early dismissal did not spare Mary. As she walked home, a white man, a father, chased her up a desolate street, threw her to the ground, ripped her underpants, and before a passerby forcibly stopped him from going further, began pulling off his belt and down his pants while yelling he was going to teach her a lesson about wanting to go to school with his white children. The lengths these parents were willing to go to to keep Black children out of the schools their children attended became a churning, broily, roiling, untamed thing, a fast-moving river of hate, violence, and murderous rage that over decades has lulled and at times raged, but never fully abated. Politicians, parents, and philanthropists have led and continue to lead coordinated and massive efforts against the idea of integrating or completely sharing classrooms with Black people. Over the years, some have bombed schools rather than allow Black children to enter them. Some have rioted so enthusiastically in front of schools that Black children tried to attend that the police, the National Guard, and even the military has had to be called in to stop the violence. Along with Indigenous children, there's simply no other groups who have so regularly, vehemently, and violently had their access to quality and education and equitable education denied. To be clear, it wasn't only in the South where people, parents, and communities refused and resisted to share their schools with Black children. 
Thousands of white mothers in New York City marched from Brooklyn to Manhattan to protest the school board's modest plans to initially bus 45 Puerto Rican and Black students for integration. In Michigan, Klan members bombed school buses sitting on a lot on the morning before they were to take Black children to school. And by the 1980s, Parents reshape municipal areas all over the nation by picking up and moving far away from cities with Black people so that their children could attend schools with other white children. That said, the battle has been worth it for some. By the 1970s, along with affirmative action making classroom seats available, to Black people in colleges and universities. Efforts at desegregation at the K-12 level led to some Black people having long denied opportunities to equitably access educational options, jobs, and economic advancement. Both policies, integration and affirmative action, which were implemented a decade apart, have faced constant opposition and consistent dismantling. The result is that in 2021, the Economic Policy Institute found that unaddressed school segregation remains a major and long-standing policy failure, at, at arguing that it continues to co-sign most Black children to schools that put them behind academically. While today, talk of racial and economic segregation is often a code word for poverty, despair, and underfunded decline, reams of scholarly research, newspaper reports, and anecdotal evidence make clear that in the United States, Black, Brown, and Indigenous children who desegregate well-resourced, predominantly white, high-performing schools and classrooms become Supreme Court justices, are asked to serve as Vice President, Attorney General, CEO, and even President of the United States. They're launched into a certain strata of society simply by attending schools where the plumbing works, the air conditioners blow cool air during the hot months, and in the winter, the heaters warm classrooms and the children sitting in them. Lawrence Tribe, a professor of constitutional law at Harvard University, says there is what he calls a massive body of evidence proving that underfunded schools disproportionately attended by Black and Latinx children have turned generations of children into a permanent underclass. The opposite is also true. For Black people, attending desegregated schools created a Black elite. One truth that's perhaps simple and maybe not is that the way we in the United States integrated schools made racial progress and economic opportunity possible for a relative few Black people. It also made social progress and economic opportunity much, much, much more difficult for the many to achieve. Integration as a supposed policy cure, much like some for the treatment of cancer, is a cure of a killing kind. I don't know when the day will come, but I believe a, mon a morning will dawn when we have as a nation will collectively toast our wrestled defeat of an inequitable education that benefited or punished based on skin color and familial and generational access to high paying jobs, college degrees and home equity. On that day, I hope we struggle to remember why it was the powerful and the wealthy in the United States created, allowed, and then largely ignored an educational system so starkly divided. Before the future past can find us, we who believe in justice will need to fully acknowledge the failure of the dream of shared access to resources in institutional governance that was to have been complete integration in the United States. We'll have to speak the reality of how educational segregation continues to cement, cement caste at the high and low ends of the status spectrum in the United States.
We'll need to teach the truth of how desegregation has benefited small percentages of Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and poor children in such spectacular ways that we celebrate their, their becoming elected officials, award-winning journalists for top media outlets, captains of industry, scholars with endowed chairs at elite universities. We'll have to say we were so dazzled by the heights they scaled, we rarely noted how the visible success of the desegregators often required forgetting, or at least choosing not to see, the quicksand sucking children who are the unluckily segregated down and out of view. The complete story of education in the United States is operatic in its dramatic highs and overwrought lows. The peaks and valleys rise and fall in registers that sometimes harmonize and sometimes diverge into discord. It sometimes transforms and sometimes devastates. We have to join together and fight for a world where the best of what education is can be shared by all. Thank you. Oh, wise and sharp words indeed. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to Carolyn Crockett. Uh, continue the uh, account of some some recent history. Mm. Thank you, Jonathan, and and thanks so much to uh, the conveners and and for you in particular for bringing us together. Um, the sister here at Brown, Professor Rooks, offers a very powerful sort of framing for thinking about big questions that matter. So I'm hoping to just continue that thread a bit. I'm Carolyn Crockett. I'm a professor of of planning, of policy and history in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. So um, really humbled and, and, and delighted to be with this incredibly important and august uh, group of folks here. So um, I think for me, you, you know, we think about this, this question of uh, this theme of more, more, more teaching and, and less testing. Uh, it centers me on this question of what is it that we're saying is at stake? what are the stakes here? And um, these questions are not just intellectual or philosophical or abstract in any way. There's quite a lot of, of consequence for families, for young people, um, and not just economic impacts, but we're talking about human development at the highest order. And so wanting to make sure that we are centering what it is that we mean by student achievement or student success um, is is crucial and historically this question about uh, education and education battles being a cauldron for high level racial equity fights has got to also sit in our, our crosshairs uh, and so for me uh, it's significant because we're also looking here uh, here in Boston at the 50th anniversary year of of DSEG and busing and so as we know in 1974. The buses rolled here uh, it, in response to Judge Garrity's decision to uh, to make forced busing the way that Boston would supposedly achieve racial uh, racial integration and racial equity um, after dealing with so many years of a, a recalcitrant uh, city council um, and city and school committee, and so um, really really important to to kind of hold that focus and particularly for me. My grandmother was one of the plaintiffs, uh, Mary Young Crockett, had joined Tulula Morgan in suing the Boston School Committee uh, in 1973. And so um, for my family, the story of, of racial integration, of educational e excellent, excellence and access has been a very, very important part of our own story. And it's something that has really actually influenced my scholarship quite a bit. Uh, last summer, I had a chance to actually go to uh, my family's hometown. Uh, my family came to Boston in the 50s from Excelsior, West Virginia, where my family uh, was coal, where there were coal miners. And so I was really eager to, to learn a little bit more about that story and to ask could, kind of what is it that would make coal mining people, coal mining Black people, leave that, come to Boston, and then in short order, uh, sue City Hall, the school committees, or take these folks on. And, and what has been interesting is to find that the story of, of, of racial integration 
in other communities was quite different, uh, much like, again, the sister there from Brown had just noted. And so significant to think about the ways that, at least for my family, when I was able to go into the archives and look at what the conditions were, um, the, the school, the conditions of the buildings um, maybe were not that great. The education was absolutely top notch. And so a very strong educational experience that was that was received by my grandmother, her sisters and brothers, also looking at what it meant to desegregate the schools, which they experienced desegregation in Excelsior, West Virginia in 1966. So some years before the Boston experience, and it was peaceful um, and it was quiet. And so my grandmother being informed by this experience that she had of what inter successful integration uh, could look like, uh, optimistically, by every <laughs> on every count, comes to Boston thinking that the schools there, here, are terrible. Uh, very substandard to what she herself had received. When I looked into the archives, I was stunned to see that the, 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 the uh, literature teacher that my grandmother had, Miss Lipscomb, uh, had received her uh, master's degree from Columbia. This is also indication of what it meant to have advanced education and being able to and not being able to enter colleges or other places where you have an advanced degree as a black educator and you're not able to uh, to integrate yourself in a professional apparatus. And so you are in some ways relegated to teach at public high school. So in my grandmother's case, Excelsior High School had this literature teacher, Miss Lipscomb, who had a master's degree again from Columbia. And so the level of teaching, the level of excellence that was experienced by my grandmother and by many in these uh, segregated schools is notable. Because the question again that I raise is what is at stake? And if we're talking about excellent education, we know that that is not just achieved by high stakes testing, but it is much, it is absolutely achieved by a much more focused, careful and, and thoughtful understanding of who is teaching and what is being taught to all of our children. And so I also take instruction from uh, not just the Black parents and, and grandparents, like my grandmother who stood up to sue uh, the school system, uh, but also uh, activists and folks who were engaged in these battles in Boston and around the country for many years, taking instruction also from the Freedom School Stay Out Movement in Boston in 1963, 1964. Many of you know this history. Uh, alternative educational uh, programs and agendas that were rolled out, pulling students out of schools, student-centered to think about what what radical education could mean? What does that look like? What does that mean for us to answer these kinds of questions ourselves in 2024? Again, beyond the testing, um, looking at what is the content and what are students themselves saying that they want to know and they need to know? Um, and so for, for me myself, this is instructive because so much of, of what the, the pain and the trauma that the city of Boston and so many of the so much of the population here is still sort of caught in this history that has not been told well. Um, it also disguises the longer um, intergenerational story of organizing and mobilizing for different kinds of educational formats. What else can we learn from, from giants like Jim Breeden, from Noel Day, from others, from Ruth Batson, that really had actually have already presented to us alternative educational models that center educational ex excellence, that center uh, racial integration, reciprocity, um, and, and culturally relevant teaching. And so uh, this conversation that has to do with what happens at the local level in terms of policy is obviously related to what happens at the state and national level. Um, it's not lost on any of us that the Brown decision of 1954, uh, as seminal as it was for restating, reset, restating the high, uh, high water mark for what racial integration could be in schools and elsewhere, um, it's not lost on me that the Brown decision would be followed uh, two years later uh, by the 1956 Federal Aid Highway Act which for so much of my scholarship is informed by understanding the interstate highway system as another means of radically racially desegregating um, and resegregating the country quite deliberately. And so what does it mean when we think historically where we have the judicial branch sort of moving in one direction, the legislative branch in so many ways moving in an opposite direction, and all of us left in the middle to figure out what does it mean to pull our country quite literally back together 
culturally, politically, physically, and what is the role of education in this path forward? And so we have a lot to consider here, um, a lot to kind of roll up our sleeves and think through. But for me, again, this question of what is at stake truly, how can we live into so many of the dreams often from the past of what the future can be? And how do we hold true to that uh, based on what people have already offered, whether it was 50 years ago or 40 years ago, or even just last week when we brought a group of high school students to MIT's campus to ask very, very basic questions. We asked about 20 high school students, uh, what is the difference uh, between education and knowledge? And the students themselves said that for them, education was too much about sitting down and being told what to do by someone else. And that for them, knowledge was about sharing, sharing their classrooms, sharing their spaces and sharing their stories. And I was really amazed that the students uh, themselves, again, representing so many high schools across the city, said that what they wanted to do was to be able to take the top off of the school, which is one of the students that take the, the roof almost off of the top of the school and let as many people in uh, as possible. And the students themselves talked about wanting to be able to share so much of their space um, and so much of their food even with so many of the newly arriving immigrants and migrants in their families. And so that's where the story ended. And so that was a conversation from a week ago. So I share that in closing uh, to remind us that what the young people themselves are saying, uh, what they're wanting today and what they have articulated historically um, needs to be our North Star and needs to really ground us for the rest of the conversations um, that we have today. And I look forward to hearing from you and hearing from the rest of the panelists. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for some questions or comments. We'll use the raise hand on the reaction button on the bottom of your screen. Raise your hand and uh, I'll call on people as I see your, your hands up. Um, and Glenn, you might have to help because I don't have uh, that many of the, uh, but let's see if I can get everybody in view gallery. Okay, questions or comments from the floor. No one's raised their hand yet. Uh, Beth. Okay. Um, I'm always embarrassed at my lack of knowledge of history, having taught modern world history for most of my 30 years. And I, this is the first I've heard of, I'm embarrassed to say, the highway system resegregating the United States. Um, I just wonder if you could give me an example, maybe a local one, Boston, I could share with, with folks, with students. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. And so essentially in um, offering this uh, reference to the 1956 Federal Aid Highway Act, it is the moment where um, the federal government basically invests about 90 percent uh, 90 of reimbursement funding to cities and towns that want to create highways. Um, it's the way that we, we get the interstate highway system. And what happens? What happened and continues to happen is the is the way that the actual uh, alignment of highways um, would sort of push through cities. Um, and we have our own story right here in Boston. And so, in the 1960s, the interstate highway system was expanding itself through I-95. I-95 would have cut right through Cambridge Port. Uh, right through a, a slice of Roxbury, the South End and Jamaica Plain. Uh, residents were able to come together and to mobilize over many years and, and were able to successfully defeat the inner belt and the expansion of I-95. Um, that is a local example and it tells a story of how that road would have really uh, not only uh, uh, sliced parts of neighborhood, but neighborhoods, but cleared neighborhoods. And so large chunks of, of Roxbury and Jamaica Plain were cleared even starting in 1966. And so it is important for us to understand the impact 
of, of that highway expansion. And so what I'm offering is a, a, a another spatial example of how uh, racial segregation was happening through the reality of this physical infrastructure. Boston is not alone. Uh, we could tell lots of stories about what happened in New Orleans, what happened in San Francisco by the Embarcadero, what happened through Miami um, and so many parts of, of the country. And it's, it's a story we're still trying to repair ourselves from Syracuse, absolutely. Um, Rochester, I mean, on and on and on. And it is definitely informing uh, a, a great part of what Secretary Buttigieg um, in the, in the Biden-Harris White House has identified in terms of new needs to sort of repair or try to bring infrastructure funding based on the, the highways reality, the destruction, and also the racial uh, segregation and resegregation that happened historically as a result and today. A lot. So I have written a book about this, <laughs> so you can imagine. So I just hopefully spared and saved you all 30 bucks. So you don't need to read the book, but no, no, we should fighting this fight. Quiet. No, you don't need to read it, but keep fighting the fight. Right. Uh, let me remind the audience that about the same time, that's when the banks uh, were engaged in this compact redlining, right? Very, very, very uh, consciously in Boston, refusing to give uh, mortgages to f families who then would have sent uh, a black child to a, a then white white school. It was very well do documented, technically now illegal, but it certainly was operating for, for 30 years Absolutely. Um, and so when we talk about things like forced busing or desegregation of schools, it's important for us to sort of also keep in mind that there are these other factors like Jonathan is mentioning, redlining, uh, ex extreme disinvestment in urban spaces through policy that is set, that is it is creating the effect of residential segregation. And so that's also at core of what's making the education question um, so pernicious and, and long lasting. It's a, a swirl of policies that are really organizing the spaces where we live. Gotcha. Maureen, you're muted. There we go. Hi, I just want to add a story to Carolyn's story about coal miners, black coal miners, and the schools they went to that were um, decent when they were still segregated or or they it sounds like they were integrated. Mm -hmm. I was a VISTA volunteer in Salisbury, North Carolina in 1968-69 under the war and poverty. And one of the, we were trained as community organizers, whatever that meant. And one of the issues was keeping the school, the black school open, even though, you know, that, you know, that, and what the, the community wanted to do is none of the white families wanted to go to the black school. So they wanted to close. I'm trying to think of the name of the school. I think it was Pierce School or something. Hmm. And they wanted to go to the white school. And some people did. Then there were fights and so on. And then we had an organizer come from Durham named Howard Fuller. Some of you may know him hmm. from that period. And he opened uh, in Durham, North Carolina, he opened a black school anyway he came and organized us and we had this whole organization where they they left school mainly because they always got and you probably heard this story as well the black schools at least in the south and i think this is probably true in the north i grew up in detroit hmm. um was that they would get used textbooks old textbooks that were used in the white schools anyway it was a it was an amazing experience for me as well as the kids and it's changed my life as an educator and how i see things okay wow, wow. Thank, thank you for that all right thank you Phil, phyllis you're our last question before we go on to dan or comment you're muted i'm trying okay there we so go. thank you very much so carolyn this was just brilliantly presented and and I just wanted to uh, add that in addition, as you well know, you spoke, you referenced um, the, the importance of community yeah. and, how, and how critical that is. And um, here in Boston, what we're already um, historically very aware of, many of us, is that it was the most, when, when I-93 went through, it went through the most vulnerable communities that had absolutely no voting power. And so it decimated Chinatown, then yeah. the North End, and then the West End where there was a large Jewish immigrant community. Okay. So I'm I'm really grateful that you brought all of this up. Thank you very much. Thank you for the comment. All right. Okay, so 
Let's go on to Dan French. Dan, who's been in the uh, trenches uh, fighting for educational equity for a very, very long time and happily is still fighting. Dan, take it away. Okay, let me see. Can everybody see that? Yep. 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 Okay. Um, so thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about authentic assessment, um, give a little context of what's where we are in the education world in Massachusetts, talk about uh, in a, a, an alternative assessment initiative that <clears throat> is grassroots that's going on within the state. And then given that progressive social change to attain greater equity, never comes without a fight, uh, talking about the need to pair practice with policy advocacy. So here's where we are after um, really 20 years of, of um, high stakes standardized tests, but uh, the state wasn't publishing disaggregated data in the early years. But what you'll see, uh, if you can't see the screen, there's it compares 2007 black, white to 2022, it does the same thing for Latinx, English learners, low-income kids, and kids with disabilities. And what you'll basically see is the gaps that were there 15 years ago are the same gaps that are there today. And um, that it's particularly notable given that um, the fastest growing subgroups of kids in Massachusetts are low-income kids, Latinx kids, and English learners. It's not necessarily a surprise for many of us who know that the standardized testing movement really was founded with by the eugenics movement in the late 1800s, early 1900s, that uh, set out to build tests that would prove that white people were smarter than everybody else in the world. So, <clears throat> There's also the untold damage. There's um, with the high stakes nature of the graduation nature of the test, there's at least at minimum 14,000 kids over 20 years have completed their high school graduation requirement but failed the state test and countless more who, dro who dropped out after failing the t state test and not wanting to continue their education. So. The effect has been dramatic, and most two thirds of those 14,000 are English learners and students with disabilities. The majority, vast majority, kids of color and low income kids. And what's um, amazing <laughs> is that the test doesn't even test what's most important for today. And this comes from aggregated polls of parents businesses, higher education institutions, trade institutions, et cetera, you name it. They're all united around kids learning uh, a much higher level of knowledge. So in 2016, we had the legislature, we were filing bill after bill to end MCAS and the legislature kept saying, well, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? So really thanks in large part to a state senator, Pat Jalen, um, who brought a couple of us together saying, can we build that alternative? We uh, launched the Massachusetts Consortium for Innovative Educational Assessment. So the, the you, one of the unique things about it is that the governing board consists of the superintendents and teacher union presidents of member districts at the table together, one of the few consortia that I know of in the country that basically say that if we're going to make social change within the education arena, teacher unions need to be at the decision-making table with the same voice and power as districts. And the goal really was to say, you know what? A school quality and student learning really go hand in hand. They both influence the other. So we're going to both build um, a school, a different type of school quality measurement um, than the current one, which basically 
makes decisions about kids, schools, districts, using one single indicator, a very flawed and racist standardized test. Um, so <clears throat> we, we look at all of those, each of those areas that are listed there, have multiple data indicators that we collect. Every school has this and they can look at where they stand, including student and teacher surveys and we're about to integrate parent surveys as well. And it's to be used really as a driver of school improvement, not punish, reward and punish. And we're also de designing high quality performance assessments and um, that actually was that designing of an elementary school playground was actually a uh, performance assessment that they did in an elementary school in Revere, where they actually were building a new elementary school playground. And kids had to submit their uh, take measurements. Uh, so it was a math exercise, take measurements and also build uh, their model playground it went into a contest and eventually the winning design was used as the the blueprint for building that playground so what we so the the goal is to basically say that it's really teachers who are the education and assessment experts not folks in the state the legislature or or for-profit corporations out there that are building the tests and how to build the capacity of teachers to really build culturally responsive uh, curriculum embedded performance tasks. So we have launched um, over those years, we trained teams in every single school, participant school, um, how you build vibrant, robust, culturally responsive performance assessments, and then work with them to put, put them out front to build the capacity of the entire faculty. Um, we now have a performance assessment task bank that's, that's uh, all teacher-generated tasks that have been reviewed by trained teachers to and give, giving feedback to the teacher authors um, there are lots of opportunities for cross-district scoring of student work, and we've now launched a pilot to build school-wide performance assessment systems in which student learning is assessed primarily by student work derived from performance assessments. Now, the problem with Massachusetts is that there's huge impediments to scaling. MCAS is still a graduation requirement. So they have, teachers have to pay attention to that. We have a very conservative state board of ed. We have federal requirements on standardized testing and comparability that are very technical and involved. Um, we, uh, we're tr trying to pilot these systems while adhering to all those requirements. And there's the whole issue of time. <clears throat> and Teachers today have been, the newer teachers today, their entire careers have been spent in standardized testing schools. So that brings me to my last point, which is you've got to, in order to build alternatives, you really need to pair practice with public engagement. So we have been, we side by side, we have public forums on all the work that's going on. We also, where we ask all the local legislators from each district to come and participate in these annual spring district ed exhibitions. We've gotten legislative support and funding every year, which is not good enough because we're now pairing with the two state teacher unions to, uh, Put leg to push legislation through that would eliminate the MCAS graduation requirement. And if not, there'll be a ballot on the ref a, a referendum on the ballot in 2024 to do so. Um, 
And ultimately, we've got to also work at the federal level of pressing the feds to change testing regs. And we can do that through supporting Representative Bauman's Support More Teaching, Less Testing Act. So um, the main point is you, you have to, in order to build alternatives, you have to also fight the fight at the state and federal levels. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dan. Very comprehensive. The road is long, but the path is well marked. Um, I know that be we could uh, discuss for two hours Dan's presentation. Uh, I don't think we want to shortchange the the next panel, which uh, yeah. uh, moves uh, along on 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 some of this stuff. So let me turn it over uh, to Lisa Geismond. Uh, who's chairing our next panel. Lisa is one of the original Brookline pa parents who organized against the initial uh, MCAS and many years the executive director of Citizens for Public Schools. Lisa. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I'm Lisa Geisbon, executive director of Citizens for Public Schools, and I'm really honored to be part of this incredible group of speakers and participants I got involved in public education ad advocacy about 25 years ago as the parent of a child on an individualized education plan, getting special education. And having learned about special education and the concept of individual individualized education, the one-size-fits-all, high-stakes, standardized testing regime struck me immediately as being fundamentally at odds with special education and individualization. So I became concerned about these policies and their impact first on my own child, and then on other children with special learning needs, and finally on all children whose education was going to be cur curtailed by this narrow and narrow-minded system. Three things have long boggled and troubled my mind about the perpetuation of the high-stakes testing system here in Massachusetts. The first is the way our most experienced and most highly esteemed educators are ignored or silenced when they try to speak out about the negative consequences of the system. The second is the way the demands to comply with the testing regime press educators to go against their own best interests, which in most cases are to look out for the best interests of the students in front of them. And the third is the way the policymakers who extol the virtues of data-driven education refuse to examine the data and the evidence pointing to the harms of their policies on children, students, and educators. So I'm very thrilled to be able to listen to these highly esteemed and experienced educators on our panel today to hear their thoughts on the consequences of high-stakes standardized testing for our students and educators. So I'll introduce our four panelists. Uh, first, we have Alexandra. A.J. Rathman Noonan, who's the Director of School Support for the New York Performance Standards Consortium, which is a network of 38 public schools in New York State that have operated for the past 25 years under a variance, allowing the use of performance assessments in place of standardized testing for high school graduation. After years as a high school science teacher and school leader in New York City schools, she worked for several years supporting schools with the New York City Department of Education prior to her work directly with the consortium. Then we'll have Kathy Greeley, who worked in Cambridge Public Schools for over 20, uh, 35 years as a middle school humanities teacher, program developer, and a literacy coach. She now serves on the MTA Retired Members Committee and works with Cambridge Retired Educators United. She's been active in the movement to end high stakes testing as long as I have since 1998. She's the author of two books, Why Fly That Way, Linking Community and Academic Achievement, and more recently, Testing Education, A Teacher's Memoir. Dr. Denisha Jones is the Executive Director of Defending the Early Years and an adjunct professor at Sarah Lawrence College and Howard University. Her research interests include organizing activist research projects that examine grassroots movements, 
to achieve racial justice in education, documenting the value of play as a tool for liberation with an emphasis on global approaches to play, and collaborating with parents and educators to foster racial, ethnic, and cultural identity development in the early years. Her first co-edited book, Black Lives Matter at School, an Uprising for Educational Justice, was published in December 2020 by Haymarket Books. And Dr. Lewis Kruger is Professor Emeritus at Northeastern University. He previously served as Director of the School Psychology Programs at both Tufts and Northeastern Universities. Received his doctorate from Rutgers University, which awarded him the Peterson Prize in 2009 for his contributions to professional psychology. In 2022, Lou received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Massachusetts School Psychologists Association. He's published more than 40 scholarly articles and book chapters. Lou co-edited and edited three books, including one on high stakes testing. He was on the editorial boards of scholarly journals in education and school psychology for more than 30 years and served as associate editor for two journals. His documentary film about high stakes testing, which we saw a little bit at the opening of this conference, Children Left Behind is available on the Canopy streaming service. So each of our speakers will speak for about six minutes. And uh, in this session, please hold your questions and comments until all four have spoken and then we'll have some time. So I pass it over now to AJ. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for being here. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to, uh, tell a hopeful story <laughs> about um, how a group of committed educators, parents, and students um, successfully resisted bad education policy in New York and freed themselves of the burden of high stakes testing. We'll talk a little bit about how it happened, um, how, what is it allowed to flourish uh, in New York State, and um, where we hope to go from here, and in many ways builds right off of where Dan left us at the end of the last uh, panel. So um, how do we get here? <laughs> uh, I think it's important to note because we often hear that standardized testing is a necessary tool to identify and support struggling schools, that actually the genesis of what led to the New York Performance Standards Consortium was an effort to identify and improve struggling schools led by the New York State Ed Department that was um, under the leadership of Tom Sobel, in the 90s. And Tom Sobel believed in what he called top-down support for bottom-up school reform. And he created a program that paired successful schools with those that were looking to learn. And it turned out that many of the mentor schools had in common uh, approaches to teaching and learning, and especially to an assessment that differed from many other schools in New York State. So in New York State, we have a battery of tests at the high school level called the Regents Examinations. And they've been with us for a century, um, but have taken on um, an even heavier burden over the last decades um, when they became required for graduation. Um, at the time in the 90s, they were an option. Then they were sort of the gold standard of education in the state, um, but it wasn't working out great. And actually this group of schools didn't organize around the Regents exams. They organized around performance-based assessment, authentic assessment that really centered students and their, and their learning and their thinking. Um, and this group of schools um, led by uh, the legendary educator, Deborah Meyer, by my colleague, Ann Cook and others, um, approached the commissioner at that time in the late 90s and asked for a variance. They said, we wanna offer Regents diplomas that are seen by the state of New York as equivalent to the one where you just have to sit and pass these tests. Um, but we wanna offer that through a, a, a gateway where students are doing performance-based assessments and the waiver variance was granted. However, um, shortly after that, uh, the, the commissioner retired and also the sort of standards movement of the 1990s morphed into the standardized testing movement of the early 2000s. And the new idea at the state level was, we will raise standards in schools by requiring all students in every school, public school in New York State to um, 
pass five regions exams in order to graduate. So there's no option to graduate from high school without that, like there was in the 90s. Um, and actually, in fact, he had to dead every school in New York State, but very, very quickly, the independent schools went and they said, no, 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 we're not doing that. And, <clears throat> but the public schools had to live with it. Um, and that is when the consortium was really born <laughs> because the next five years became a day-to-day -day fight to maintain the variance that the um, Tom Sobel had um, and the government had given to the group of schools. And to and part of that process was a process that was led by educators, right? Formalizing the shared performance assessment system that this group of schools were going to have, writing rubrics, writing tasks, moderating, really building up a robust um, system that could stand up to, uh, and it was a positive um, uh, mirror to what was going on with the rest of the state. And then also just like people out there writing letters, talking to legislators, marching in Albany, um, lawsuits, um, a group of parents organizing an, uh, um, a, another organization called Time Out from Testing that did an amazing job during that time of pointing out the serious flaws in the region's exams themselves. And just through multiple years of work um, in a collective coalition of people, finally in 2005, um, the commissioner relented and said, okay, fine, you can keep your variance we're go forth and we do have to have it renewed regularly um but since that point in time we've really been able to build something because we've had um we've had a space to um, create assessments that protect student-centered learning and so where are we today um as lisa said um the consortium is 38 schools. They are traditional public non-charter schools in New York State. 36 are in New York City. Two are in upstate New York, one in Ithaca and one in Rochester. Um, I saw I saw Dan on here, who is who is historically from our Rochester school. And um and it's a diverse group of schools. There are um screen schools, lottery schools, um, schools specifically for newly arrived immigrants, six to 12 schools, transfer schools. And, and part of the strength of what has allowed us to flourish actually is the diversity of our schools, of our students, of the faculties, um, because all of the work is done in collaboration and that diversity has made us very strong. Um, so we've built over these 20, now 20, 25 years, what we call a system of performance assessment that is practitioner or are student focused, practitioner developed, and externally assessed. And what that looks like is a set of performance based assessment tasks that every graduate of a consortium school completes. Um, <clears throat> there are extended pieces of writing and an oral defense in each of the major disciplines. Um, there's a common framework for what those tasks look like, though they are um, by design come out of the individual curriculum of every individual school in every classroom. So um, we it's very important to us that unlike a standardized test, assessments in the consortium come out of curriculum rather than being imposed from the top. And they allow students to pursue their own interests and their own ideas um, through historic, literary analysis, historical research, science experimentation, engineering design, mathematical problem solving, and there's a real emphasis on depth of thinking rather than breadth of content exposure, which um, would not be possible if we were not um, unburdened of the standardized testing regime in New York. Um, <clears throat> it also has allowed a whole bunch of other connected practices to thrive, right? Our schools were leaders in the use of restorative justice in schools. Um, other practices that have sort of grown in schools like advisory, um, where teachers and students are connected to one another over time, Can use of community service, internships, other real world learning opportunities. Our schools have been doing this for decades because it is all part and parcel with a, a performance, with an assessment system that centers students and their own ideas. So where are we now in New York State? <laughs> 
So in the background of this work that we've been doing in our little, um, under our variants for the past 20 years, the pendulum has sort of sw swung all the way towards a very, very restrictive graduation regime where every student had to pass five regents exams. There were thousands of kids as described by Dan and there continue to be many students who are denied diplomas because of a failure to meet specific test scores. And there are, there are five. Um, and, um, and then gradually they started to create more openings for, for, for um, appeals, for to support specific students, um, different pathways um, and, and things have sort of started to creep back. But New York state remains one of only nine states in the country that still require um, a test score. And in our case, it's still four test scores um, to graduate from high school. And, <clears throat> and we are hopeful that the New York state is currently in a process where they're revising graduation standards. Um, there was a blue ribbon commission that was convened and while everyone talked about the flaws of the regents exams. Unfortunately, that commission only came out with a recommendation to quote unquote, modify and or reduce rather than eliminate the um, requirement for uh, assessments for graduation. Um, but that being said, there's uncertainty about what will happen in the future, though there is some expressed um, interest in expanding options for performance assessment. And we are you know, doing our best um, from where we sit to make sure that the consortium and what we do is seen as a model and is something others can learn from so that we can really create more space to do this for more students in New York State. So thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, AJ. Um, before we go on to Kathy Greeley, do any of the other panelists on this panel want to comment or um you know, speak to AJ's presentation. If not, I'll hand it over to Kathy. Hey, everybody. I was told I had six minutes to talk about the burden of high stakes testing, uh, standardized testing on teachers, and I would add students. Um, it's going to be hard to do it in six minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I believe that if parents had been asked in 2001 to send their children to schools, as our schools are today, they would have refused. There would be instant and mass rebellion. I don't think parents could have uh, subjected their children to the excessive kind of testing the extreme focus on data, the standardization and scripting of curriculum, the top-down mandates, the developmentally inappropriate demands on children, the silencing of teachers. I think schools have become a place of stress, anxiety, and fear. This is evidenced by the high rate of um, behavior and mental health issues that we're seeing among our children, as well as the exodus of teachers and administrators from the profession, feeling demoralized, overwhelmed, and undervalued. I know some people may attribute this to the pandemic, but um, COVID really just shed light on these problems that we have the data from before COVID had been festering for decades given the testing mania that has increasingly dehumanized school. So I feel like I'm kind of the downer after AJ, <laughs> um, but I wanted to just share a couple of things about um, some of the issues that I've mentioned and give a couple of examples. So one is excessive testing. In, in Massachusetts, the MCAS test involves anywhere from four to eight days of testing between March and May. It used to be more than that. Um, with the pandemic, they reduced it by uh, a little bit. But this is for children in grades three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10. This doesn't include the time that teachers need to take to prepare kids for the, these tests. Some teachers, like when I was preparing kids, I took a week or two to go over those um, how do you get ready for to take a standardized test? 
But there are schools, because the stakes are so high for them, they spend a lot of their school time all year preparing to take standardized tests. The most, while most children take about two hours for each day of testing, I have seen children take all day to complete the MCAS for one test, and then they may be doing more. I think this is um, maybe Massachusetts comprehensive, as MCAS should be Massachusetts child abuse system, because I think it has been incredibly abusive to kids. I think if anyone here thinks back to their own time of um, taking the SATs or GREs or something, you remember how depleted you felt at the end of that. That was one day. We do this to kids four, five, six, seven, eight days at a time. Um, in addition to that, the MCAS has given rise to all sorts of additional tests that we ask kids to take to get ready to take the test. So one year in Massachusetts, in um, Cambridge, where I was teaching, we counted up, there were 22 tests given to kids during the, um, during the year, 22 required district or state tests. That's number one. Number two is a concern about the narrowing of our curriculum. Many schools feel the pressure around high stakes tests. They've dropped teaching of anything but literacy and math. These schools are generally found in poor and poor urban or rural districts. Rather than expanding underprivileged children's educational experiences, we have dramatically limited them. Even in Cambridge, just this year, the school department decided to limit recess time, lunch time choice and nap time for four-year-olds, um, along with cutting back science time and social studies time in elementary schools so we could focus more just on literacy and math. When I share with other teachers how we used to do monologues and plays and write children's books and build bridges and paint murals and map neighborhood trees, teachers look at me like, what planet are, are you on? Like, how did you do that? Um, because there's no more time or opportunity to do this kind of learning when the stakes are so high for your kids to pass the test. Um, I'll just say I've mentioned some of the developmentally inappropriate demands, but I'm just going to also mention, I don't know if people realize that uh, third graders who are eight years old are being asked to take uh, to write literary essays on the computer. So they have to read some articles and then they have to put together their thoughts and type out an essay. And this is a significant part of their score is how they do on this. Children in first grade, we used to learn how to read in first grade. Now we give tests to children about whether how well they can read before they enter first grade. We used to do finger painting and blocks and uh, creative playtime in kindergarten. And now I find kindergartners sitting at desks doing worksheets, doing things that they have no business to be doing right now. Um, I think my time's almost up, but I'm going to just say two more things. One is the intense focus on data-driven instruction. I really appreciated Lisa's point that in spite of all the data, our, our state seems to want to ignore the data. But in schools, we spend hours and hours looking at numbers. And we have meetings to analyze test scores. And I used to run these meetings. And my teachers would leave the meetings crying because they didn't know what else they could do to help some of the students who were struggling. Um, and I just think just looking at this very narrow, narrow kind of data really obscures our understanding of who our children are and who are the human beings in front of us. And my last point, um, Lisa also touched on, which is silencing of teachers. When the MCAS and corporate ed reform really took off, teachers and parents were organizing against this because we saw what was coming down the pike. And in the, um, the corporate reformers, however, said that teachers were only concerned about saving our jobs. 
They said, you're just worried about being held accountable. They said, your unions only want to protect the bad, the bad teachers or the dead wood. And I still to this day hear those arguments being used against teachers as we try to speak out against the system that we have seen really destroy our schools. Um, and people are being intimidated into silence. And I could say a lot more about that, but um, there are many more things I could say, but I, I will stop there. And I just hope it gives you a little glimpse into what our world as teachers and our students is like. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, you know, it's it's not happy the the description that you give, but I think no, it's it's true and um, truth and knowledge are powerful. So you're empowering us with with your testimony. So I'm going to move us along. We're getting a little behind, so let's uh, pass it over to. Dr. Denisha Jones for her. She's going to expand on some of what Kathy talked about with younger children. Take yes, it. thank you all. Um, pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, so yes, I'm talking about the impact specifically to young children and it's, and it's related to everything you've heard, what Lisa said, uh, what Kathy said, but really thinking about our youngest students, right? I hear, I used to hear from a lot of people, well, standardized testing doesn't happen until third grade, so it doesn't affect them. But what we know it's, it's not, it's changing the landscape of early childhood dramatically um, and for the worse, right? So students in kindergarten are taking assessments. I was teaching kindergarten Washington DC in 2003 and I was told by my principal that I had to teach them how to bubble in and create barriers so they would know how to do this for first grade. So I gave up precious time in their only year of kindergarten to make them take spelling tests, make them practice bubbling in answer sheets and, and creating barriers. Um, so it was already happening then. And then typically when they get out of kindergarten into first grade, they start taking pre-tests because now everything is about thinking about how you're going to do on that third grade test. So they start making them taking assessments and benchmark assessments, they call them, um, in first grade. And so I want to explain a little bit about what happens to young children based on these benchmarks and assessments. And it could look different in all schools, right? But for the most part, so you, you have a group of first graders and you give them these benchmark assessments and you look at this data and it says that um, you know, this percentage of students are doing well, they're going to do fine, so they might get ignored, right? This percentage of students are going to do really bad, and so some schools try and get them to not to take the test and not bring down the scores, but where they focus their efforts are on those percentage of students who they think are going to do better enough to improve the scores. So if your child is not in that group, they're getting less emphasis on things from teachers and academic things because of that, right? So that's also dangerous, right? They're only, the testing culture makes you zero in on the space where you think you can have a change or you can make the most impact, right, and make the most gains. And they use benchmark assessments to prove that along the way. And so a lot of teachers tell me their they're kids are just not doing, there's nothing happening. They're not getting anything out of school. They're not learning anything. They're not getting anything because they're not a focus and the focus is on improving test scores because of where they may fall, right, in that group. Either they're already going to do well, so they're not getting a lot, um, or they're not getting, um, they're not, they don't believe that they have a chance of moving forward. Um, so that's one negative. Um, the other thing which uh, Lisa talked about, and I'm sorry, Kathy talked about was the way it's impacting the curriculum and what they are getting. Um, so at Defending the Early Years, a couple years ago, um, Diane Levin and Judy Van Horn wrote a report, and I will drop the link in the chat when I'm done talking, um, where they looked at school, the impact of school reforms on young children by interviewing uh, a group of teachers who had taught, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, in early childhood from across the country, and, and they were looking at what has changed, right? And so predominantly, these teachers worked with low-income children, Title I schools, uh, predominantly Black, Indigenous, and children of color. And what they found is that these so-called reforms that were supposed to help these children over the past 20 years had taken away all the things that made early childhood a great space to be in. So play, inquiry, center, choice, all of these things were being removed in the name of school reforms that were supposed to help these children, but were actually giving them a second tier education, not what wealthy white privileged kids were getting in other spaces, right? So there is that change in the curriculum that happens as well, which is very problematic. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, is the the actual results from what's happening uh, for for academic preschools, right? So 
preschool used to be, as Kathy mentioned, a place where kids didn't have to know how to read. You were really learning about social emotional development, physical development, language. There was some cognitive, but it was really about how you thought about things, right? Because if kids could demonstrate how they thought about things, then we can kind of get an idea where their thinking skills were. But we weren't forcing, when we said cognitive development, it wasn't only about math and literacy, right? It was like your general approach to new things, right? Approaches to learning, right? It's something that they said. So that's how preschool and kindergarten was. And then it, and then it shifted. Um, and part of that shift is as we fight to expand access to universal pre-K, the downside of that is that it gets pushed into public schools and the focus becomes academic. And I know that's happening right now with Massachusetts. I've joined the 930 call. If you're not familiar, it's a coalition in the state of early childhood people who are, you know, working against the law, working uh, together to put to promote uh, universal pre-K in the state. And so as much as we want access to universal pre-K, because it is an important equity issue for families, we have to caution against tying it into this academic, right? President Biden has been clear that he doesn't believe in care. He doesn't believe in child care. He believes in early child education. And that's a false uh, dichotomy that gets us in trouble. Care is education and education is care. And young children don't need school. They need care, right? That inc it includes education, right? So in Tennessee, a couple years ago, they had an opportunity to do the first randomized control study in early child education. And for those of you who are academics and researchers, you understand that it is a big deal to have a randomized control longitudinal study. So how did this come about? They were expanding universal pre-K in in Tennessee. So that meant government funded pre-K-4 was now available. So what happened was they only had it available to a certain amount of students. So what they were able to do was get a cohort that year of every child who enrolled in the state funded pre-K-4 program. And then all the students who applied but couldn't get in were then the other cohort, right? So now you have two groups that you can study as they go through school. So that gave them this randomized control study that they were able to do. So the, the, uh, the team at Vanderbilt, they're underway. Um, at the end of the pre-K-4 year, they tested all of the children. And so all they know is the children who didn't go into pre-K-4 were not enrolled in any type of academic preschool. They were either cared for at home or cared for by family, kin, but they were not in a formalized preschool setting until kindergarten, right? They didn't go anywhere for pre-K-4. So they tested all of those children at the end of the pre-K year. And of course, the pre-K children look really great in testing. They spent a year in an academic preschool being taught academic preschool skills. So at the end of the year, they're great. And everyone jumped on that. Yes, let's invest in universal pre-K because look, these kids at the end of the year are great. But then they tested them again at the end of the kindergarten year. And by the end of kindergarten, the kids who did not go to academic preschool caught up to the kids who did. So that gap, right, could think about it. When you start pre-kindergarten, you should then acquire all the skills you need in kindergarten to be successful that year. So kids who did not go to preschool, they got to kindergarten. By the end of the kindergarten year, they're doing just as well as the kids who spent an extra year in pre-K. Okay. But then they kept going. And then they got to third grade. And they're testing the two groups again. And now they're seeing that the kids who went to academic preschool are doing worse on a variety of measures in third grade and even worse by sixth grade, not just academic measures, but behavioral measures. They were getting in trouble in school more. They had more uh, detentions and suspensions and things like that. So what is going on here? How did the gains made from that year of academic preschool not support those children by the time they were in third and sixth grade? I will also share the link to this blog. One of the studies is, uh, one of the people who did the studies is Gail Farron, and she wrote a blog for Defending the Early Years about um, developmental competencies in early, early years. And what she argues for is that there's an iceberg model of, of skills, right? And academic preschools only focus on the surface skills up top, letter recognition, sounds, and numbers. So yeah, those look good for testing academic preschool skills. But on the bottom of the iceberg is what she calls foundational skills that are needed to enhance learning throughout school. And these are the skills that you get in a play-based environment and that parents that have the means and income are pretty much giving to their child, right? So these are things like executive functioning, inquiry, foundational skills that you need to become a lifelong learner. And so she argues that an academic preschool does not give those skills. And that's why the gains don't last. And if you're not getting the foundational skills that you would get in a child-driven preschool program, then you're not getting 
you're not going to have the payoff in the end, right? So those are just a couple of examples of how um, testing harms early childhood children, mainly because it forces them into early academics, which is not proven to, to be what we think it's going to be. It's not going to it's not going to provide long time. It denies them things that they should be getting, like play and inquiry as well, too. Um, and it brings a lot more testing with the early academics into the early childhood years. Okay. Thank you, Denisha. Um, I'm going to now pass it over to our last panelist. And after Lou finishes, we'll have time, a little bit of time for questions and answers. Lou? Are oh, you muted, Lou? Got to unmute. I apologize. Okay, there you go. Yep. Wow, that's a lot of great information. I'll try to, I'll be brief and try to get us back on track in terms of the schedule. Uh, just share a couple of thoughts. One is that just as climate scientists from different research organizations have reached consensus on human caused global warming, the leading experts on assessment have also reached consensus on the appropriate use of educational tests, including high stakes tests that are used to determine if a student will get a high school diploma. And I looked at several different organizations, what they said, they had the leading experts in the nation, in the world on assessment and testing, and they all virtually said the same thing. So I'm just gonna quote one of them, the National Research Council. An education decision that will have a major impact on a test taker should not be made solely or automatically on the basis of a single test score. Other relevant information about the student's knowledge and skills should also be taken into account. So in essence, we have nine states in the United States that are totally ignoring the advice of the leading experts in assessment and testing. And one of the reasons that they came to this conclusion about high stakes tests and not using them as the sole indicator of uh, important decisions is one of the reasons is because of unintended negative consequences. And Denisha, Kathy, Dan have done an excellent job of talking about what some of these unintended consequences are. And I just wanna highlight a couple of others that I've become interested in over the years. One is in terms of the graduation rate. Massachusetts likes to tout itself as number one in education, but guess what? We're nowhere near close to being number one in the nation in terms of our graduation rate. And it's because we have a major headwind, high stakes testing, passing the test in order to graduate. In fact, Massachusetts is 15th in overall graduation rate and only 26, an embarrassing 26th in graduating low income students on time. In addition, students who failed one of the required high stakes tests on their first attempt were 20 more, 21 more times likely to drop out than those who passed the test. I'll just repeat that, 20 more, 21 more times to drop out. So the other area that I've been interested in terms of these unintended negative consequences, which haven't gotten, at least by our, from our state, much attention, is the psychological consequences, the stress this places on the, in the family and particularly the student who fails the test. And my colleagues and I have inter interviewed a number of students over the years who've 
gotten all the way through high school, but haven't passed all three tests. So they've tried repeatedly to pass these tests. And I'll just quote one of these students, Robert. Uh, he was an English learner from Haiti. He completed all four years of high school. He passed the English and mathematics exams, but was stymied by the required science exam. And here's what he said. When I saw I did not pass the test, I almost killed myself because of the way I was down. All my coaches, my teachers come to me, talk to me about it. Don't kill yourself for that man because your future can still be good. And he go, went on to say, I can say everything shut down in my life because I don't have a high school diploma. Everything. Even my girlfriend left me. She's in college now. She's looking for a better life and I cannot give her a better life. We have no idea how many more Roberts are out there and what's happened to them. Because to my knowledge, our Department of Education has not systematically investigated the unintended consequences of high test sky, high stakes testing. Massachusetts policymakers have defied the overwhelming consensus of the leading experts on how statewide educational tests should be used. It's hard to imagine our officials would be so emboldened to ignore the clear consensus of the leading ex experts on global warming, then why do they do it in regard to educational tests? Regardless of the reason, when it comes to educational tests, our state officials have sadly, sadly abandoned their ethical responsibility to do no harm. That's it. Did I keep within my time limits? You did. You were All very right. Very good. You get the prize for <laughs> being, being staying within the time. Uh, so we're actually at the end of our time, but we did promise that we'd have a little bit of time for Q&A. So uh, let me check in with um, our fearless leaders. Do we? Can we take a few more minutes? Whoever's in charge of this, <laughs> Jonathan Cole. Uh, right. Take a few more minutes. I don't think we have Carol Doherty on yet. Okay, good. Got a little time to fill. Okay, so. Um, oh, okay. She just shut up. Actually, <laughs> wait. Take that back. Carol's on. So, let's let's turn it over to Alan. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa looks very sad. I am. <laughs> Um, I'm Alan Jalen. I'm also with Citizens for Public Schools in Massachusetts. Uh, the federal government plays a, only a very small role in funding our schools, only about 8%, uh, according to the Department of Education. But since No Child Left Behind became law a generation ago in 20, 2001, federal rules have played an outsized role in determining what happens in public schools with huge annual testing mandates coupled with disruptive penalties for low test scores. When No Child Left Behind mm -hmm. was proposed, a lot of progressive members of Congress bought into it in large part because it promised a big increase in federal funding. So for example, the late Senator Ted Kennedy was a big proponent. I was working at the National Education Association in Washington at the time. And I remember he came over with his two very big dogs to try to convince the NEA executive board to sign on. And one of my friends had to take care of these giant dogs while he went in to talk to the board. Uh, in the end, they did not support the bill, but they did stay neutral. At first, the increased federal aid flowed and it helped, but pretty soon it dried up. And the testing mandates and the penalties for mostly city schools that went with them 
continued and got even more severe. And that's a pattern that's been repeated at both federal and state levels. We'll give you some money if you do what we say, even though you don't think it's a good idea. Race to the top under President Barack Obama and Education Secretary Arne Duncan was the next federal example. In the wake of the Great Recession of 2008, when states were desperate for more money. So for this session about educa the education battleground in Congress, we have two speakers, and I think we'll do them one at a time. First, Massachusetts State Representative Carol Doherty. Carol Doherty is a former third grade teacher, guidance counselor, two-term president of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, five-term school committee member, and a state legislator since 2020. She has seen schools from many different perspectives, and she's on the House Committee on Ways and Means, which means money. She will be talking about how Massachusetts is coping with the federal shortfall. Carol? Well, thank you very much, Alan. I appreciate that uh, introduction. My mother would be proud, and I am pleased to be invited to present here. So you're going to be the timekeeper, right, Alan? So when we get near the Running out of time, you're going to say one more minute, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, this is uh, uh, an interesting time, an interesting moment to have a conversation about the Massachusetts education budget um, alongside the uh, meager federal education budget as well, because the House has just been presented with the uh, House budget, and we will begin to debate it uh, the week after next. And so... Uh, it is, in my opinion, a great effort um, uh, on many fronts, uh, particularly on education, to fulfill our responsibility and our mandate to fully fund public education. It's a, it's a reach. Uh, education often takes the back seat to other programs or initiatives. One of the most vivid examples of this is in the federal budget. Funding for national defense, for example, is funded at a rate of more than four times the amount allocated for education, training, and employment services, admittedly, uh, regarding the military budget. We live in a, a, a dangerous world. We have been attacked at home, and our nation's allies are also being attacked overseas. Consequently, at least in this environment, on the federal level, there's not much appetite for reducing military spending, but to increase it. But Congress provides annual appropriations and periodically provides supplemental appropriations for public elementary and secondary schools, pre-K through 12, through many agencies and programs. The largest tranche of federal funding for schools is for programs authorized by, by ESEA, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, and whenever I think of federal funding, uh, at least at the school level, I think primarily of Title I funds coming uh, to uh, school districts like my own in the city of Taunton. Uh, and around the nation, $18.4 billion last year. Just to provide a picture of what the Massachusetts budget looks like, K-12 schools nationwide receive $85.3 billion, uh, a total of, uh, from the feds, a total of $1,730 per pupil from, from the feds, as I said. The states contribute $367.1 billion to K-12 public education. That's $7,000 per student. And local governments, primarily through property tax, provide $357.5 uh, $357 billion total or $7,000 per student. So it's the, as you well, as you may well know, particularly if you're from Massachusetts, the education funding is uh, federal, state, and local. Federal revenue sources include, for example, in addition to Title I, funds provided under in the individuals, the IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Medicaid reimbursements, and during the pandemic, and we're still using those resources, uh, COVID-19 federal assistance funds and uh, secondary school emergency relief funds. Uh, so to the period of 20. Uh, 23, the most recent year for which the calculations have been done, the federal government always lags behind in reporting that data for, by about by about two years. So let me. Um, so as I said, most of the education funding is provided by state and local sources, 
And while the federal government, again, provides billions of dollars, it's nowhere near what you could imagine when you think of billions. On average, uh, federal funding accounts for about 8 to 10 percent of the annual revenue provided here. Uh, it, uh, exceptions sometimes occur, as the federal government might give supplemental money to other uh, to, to, in a crisis situation. Uh, but federal revenue, on average, again, is about 10 percent of the revenue spent on public education for some states and local governments. In recent years, Massachusetts has invested about $16 billion in our public schools. That's a lot of zeros through a mixture, again, of federal, state, and local contributions. Um, even during the Great Recession, 2007, education spending in Massachusetts had steadily increased. In the school year 2020, elementary and secondary public schools revenues totaled $871 billion in constant dollars. Of this total, 8% or 66 billion were from federal sources, 47% or 414 billion from state sources, and 45% or 391 billion were from local sources. That's across the country. Um, so in the Massachusetts budget, as we have recently looked at it on Wednesday of this week, actually, I think about the three relatively new funding sources or recommendations for improving public education funding. First, the Student Opportunity Act, which was enacted by the legislature before I was in the legislature, and finally adopted about five years ago. Uh, we fell short for one year during the pandemic, but uh, since that time, the Student Opportunity Act, and this will be the second year of fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. Uh, the second thing that has happened is that on a ballot question, the millionaire's tax, or called the fair share spending um, amendment, uh, which was voted on by the populace, has provided for this year $1.3 billion. The promise has been that half of that money would go to education and the other half to uh, transportation. So there's $695 million proposed of that $1.3 billion for education, pre-K through higher education. And the third piece of this, which is significant, is that the minimum student aid uh, it currently in the fiscal 24 budget is at $60 per pupil universally. Uh, the governor had proposed $30 per pupil, and we mostly figured that Ways and Means would be recommending a $60 per pupil, which is, again, what we're spending now. But instead, the proposal is at $104 uh, per pupil. So from the current $60 in this year, $104 proposed for fiscal 25. And that represents an increase of $308.7 million. Um, now, I represent a Student Opportunity Act uh, district, the city of Taunton, which receives a considerable sum from the Student Opportunity Act because that uh, SOA, if you will, was dedicated to filling the gaps in poorer districts, particularly gateway cities. So that $104 to the other part of my district, the town of Easton, is going to mean a revenue stream, if in fact it stays in the budget, uh, at the end will be uh, $200,000 additional uh, revenues for public education. And so that's a big boost for a town like Easton that relies almost solely on property tax in order to fund its entire community budget, including public education. So to continue to grow support for public education, despite these injections of school aid for the coming year, and in the past year, uh, the Millionaire's Tax and the Student Opportunity Act, local budgets in about 211 districts haven't been able to keep up with inflation, uh, which is really a problem in school funding. The cap on inflation assessments was set at 4%. And inflation, as we know, is not 4%, but 8%. And so rural schools uh, particularly have taken a hit as they are also experiencing declining enrollments where the state counts the numbers of students that you have in order to get that uh, those uh, funds. And so their coffers are running dry and districts, as I said, like Easton and rural communities and the other 211 districts that don't 
benefit very much by the Student Opportunity Act are really hitting the wall or what's it called, the cliff effect. Uh, so the $1.5 billion in the Student Opportunity Act meant to close education funding gaps, mostly focused on plugging holes in urban districts, uh, is not uh, seen as a benefit in other districts. And so while inflation is at 8%, these districts are really going to have a hard time with their fiscal 25 spending on education. And it's highly unlikely that this year there will be any effort at all to change that 4% inflation rate. Uh, it just gets very complicated because education funding has many aspects to it, not just a straight line, chapter 70, here's your money, go spend it. Uh, so changing the inflation rate at this time, at this juncture in our budget deliberations, would add around $400 million to the budget. And I really don't think that that's going to happen. So the House budget would dedicate $6.9 billion in direct aid to school districts. The same as the governor's proposal, plus from the House, an additional $37 million in supplemental funding. That would boost the total Chapter 70 funding by nearly $309 million over fiscal 24. This fiscal 25 budget proposal from the House not only fulfills our opinion uh, and the opinion of the chair, but exceeds the funding promise that the legislature has made five years ago around the Student Opportunity Act when they overhauled the state school funding formula. If the House's proposal is adopted, the state would have dedicated that $1.6 billion in additional school funding over four budget cycles. So this year, before I go on to the federal budget um, and the disparity there, uh, this year there are going to be a lot of efforts by uh, members of the legislature to add amendments to the budget that try to address some of these disparities uh, between the districts that are receiving a nice high level because uh, well-deserved of student opportunity money uh, and the other 211 districts that are getting very little. Um, so let's move on to the federal budget. I'm terrible with slides, so I hope you're looking at these slides. Carol, try, try and speed it up because we've got... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So what I want to say about the federal budget, and which is really very critical, so the state is doing okay. But we know, uh, all of us know, with mass peace action, that the federal budget spends, the federal government spends an inordinate amount of money on the on military spending, and about uh, eight to ten percent of the discretionary appropriations for education. The Congress has appropriated about seven hundred ninety-one billion dollars this year for education, which is at about that seven to ten percent rate and nowhere near meets the needs of most uh, states in their education spending. So the, the, the problem, of course, is for us to take a look at that. And if you're looking at this pie chart, that huge amount of money that's going toward military spending, and if you track back into education, it looks like at about 6% in 2017, and I think it's between 7 and 10% or 8 and 10%, in this current, uh, looking at the 23 uh, budget allocations. And so our fight has always been to reduce that military spending, to uh, more equitably distribute that um, discretionary spending across uh, all discretionary issues like housing and healthcare and education, and help the states to provide more resources to fully fund their education programs across the country, particularly here in Massachusetts. So uh, I, I will stop right there, um, answer any questions when the question time comes. And just to say that uh, right now, as we are looking at the uh, Ways and Means budget for fiscal 25 here in Massachusetts, we're in decent shape in most of the very large uh, areas and large budget areas that we uh, are looking at to fully fund public education. Thank you, Carol. Um, Next speaker is uh, Harry Fetter, who is the executive director of Fair Test, a national organization who many of you know of, whose, the, whose mission is to advocate against the misuse and the overuse of standardized tests and for better forms of educational assessment. 
Before that, he was a social studies teacher, an education researcher, a leader in the New York Performance Standards, uh, of Performance Standards Consortium, and chair of the board of the Coalition of Essential Schools. Harry? Uh, thanks, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would add that I've, and we'll talk about this a little bit, I've also, as executive director of Fairtrust, been doing work with the groups that are are fighting uh, for the repeal of the MCAS as a graduation requirement. So I'm pretty familiar with what's going on here in Massachusetts on that front. Let me share my screen. Um, everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I should put it on the slide. Oh dear, I gotta get to the right thing here. Uh, slideshow, there we go. Oopsie, sorry. Okay, now we're good. Um, so I'm here to talk a bit, a little bit about the national landscape uh, in terms of fights over uh, exit exams or you know high stakes tests, but we're going to focus on graduation exams because that's really uh, where the state of play is in Massachusetts. Um, and before I talk about that, we have to distinguish between federal requirements and then what the states are doing. Um, so the federal government under ESSA, which is the revision of No Child Left Behind, basically says that every year from grades three through eight, uh, every student must sit for uh, and, and math and English test, and in high school, a math, English, and a science test. And that's all that federal law requires. It does not say what that you have to use these tests as a condition for graduation or in the lower grades promotion. Um, and that is, that is uh, and so the stakes of the tests are different from the regime under No Child Left Behind where you have this adequate yearly progress uh, regime and that if you if you didn't meet your goals, then uh, you know students could uh, schools could be found to be schools in need of improvement and then all sorts of measures uh, toe into play. But the current version of the law doesn't require any of that, but it does require that states administer tests. And you know, just for some comparability here, um, I'll, about half, almost half of the states in the country use uh, the ACT or the SAT as their state federal accountability test. Now, you may raise your eyebrows and say, how can they do that? It's how is that linked to curriculum? How is it linked to the standards? And, and you know, there has been some controversy in various states over that. But the truth is that when ESSA was passed, uh, there was a provision put in an addendum, not even an addendum to the law, in a, in a um, guidance on the law that said any nationally recognized standardized test could be used for these purposes. And shock of shocks, the college board uh, wrote in with its lobbyists. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the reason we got this language. Uh, and, and so the... And here is just a chart, well, not a chart, a description of the states that are using the ACT versus the SAT. Um, you know, Colorado used to use the ACT. Now they use the SAT. And now in Colorado, for example, there's some controversy because now the SAT, it's going to be even shorter because it's digital. Um, and so how do you measure or what you're supposed to measure of a high school graduation qualification? with a digital test that is norm referenced. <laughs> so kids are designed to score low and some kids are designed to score high, but the, the vast majority of kids are designed to score in the middle. It's a very weird thing. Um, the truth of the matter is you don't have to, for graduation purposes, certainly, you don't have to use any test at all. The trend has been away since No Child Left Behind from exit exams. There are only nine states left in the country that require uh, state-developed exit exams to be passed. Uh, some require two, some up to five, like New York. Um, 
in, uh, in order to graduate from high school, in order to get a high school diploma. This is down from a high of 27 post No Child Left Behind. Now, there are a lot of stories in different states as to why they tacked away from this stuff. Uh, California, for example, uh, a lot of ELL students were not doing well and, and were, weren't getting their diplomas. And find the state legislature and the governor just said, you know what? We don't we don't need this. We're not we're not getting what we want from the test. And we're putting at risk kids at greater at great risk. So they're dropping. So they they're an example of state. They just sort of dropped it. Um, and and it's also a realization that these tests don't measure what we want high school graduates to know and be able to do. And thus, a lot of states we'll talk about have developed alternatives, even even when they go beyond uh, just requiring course passage. They've developed some alternatives for students to be able to demonstrate some actual skills uh, that that might be useful for their both college or uh, just post post secondary life. Um, and I'll sort of give some examples of that as, as we move on. But the bottom line is most states, all states, their, may, their criteria for graduation is course passage and credits. Um, just so you know, even though the trend is against using uh, exit exams to graduate, this was something interesting. Uh, Ar Arizona, put in a bill uh, to make the ACT the actual Arizona graduation exam. Um, and, you know, it's a norm reference test, so you, you can't really, and in fact, you know, Maine was, got slapped by the DOE uh, because they were proposing to use a norm reference test for uh, ESSA compliance. Um, it's a very interesting thing. The state superintendent basically admitted that the ACT doesn't measure Arizona state standards, but he said, it's a test, so it's better than no test. And just so you get, there still is that mindset out there that we need standardized tests. Um, and so it is a, the, the trend is against exit exams, but as you folks in that Massachusetts know, there is a very large constituency uh, principally in Massachusetts, it's the, it's the business community or the self-represented members of the business community uh, of the Democratic Party, who are the ones who are sort of pushing for the MCAS. Um, I just talk about a few, what a few states are doing. Massachusetts, you know what we have, what you have. Um, the graduation exam is subject to two possible um removals or decoupling of the MCAS from graduation requirements. The Thrived Act is the legislation. And uh, then there's also a ballot initiative. So if legislation does does not pass, there will be a ballot. Uh, there'll be a question on the ballot. You the the there is obviously a war in the press here. Uh, I've read uh, I read Scott Le uh, Lehigh in the Boston Globe. He's certainly no uh, he's a friend of the MCAS and he's really got to be in his bonnet for the teachers union um, and versus folks like yourselves, grassroots groups and, and, and the unions that are basically saying there are better ways of measuring whether or not uh, students have the skills and knowledge to graduate. Uh, and furthermore, these kind of standardized tests because of their baked in discriminatory nature uh, leave kids who are at disadvantages at, at great risk. Um, a couple of other states, and these are Florida and New Jersey are interesting because they come at opposite ends of the spectrum. So currently, uh, well, Florida had a, a piece of legislation that would have gotten rid of the Florida state test. And that was put out there by right-wing groups. Um, and it was killed in the state legislature by Democrats actually. Uh, in New Jersey, um, there's essentially one state senator who has been sort of holding it up and successfully held it up in the last legislative session. Uh, it has currently been reintroduced uh, in the next legislative session. And I think, you know, New Jersey has been at this a while. Uh, so our folks in New Jersey tell us that 
it got a lot farther than it did the last time, uh, or it got a lot, it got pretty far the last time. It actually got hearings in both houses. Uh, and they're hopeful that it will get even further this time as uh, more pressure is put on this one particular state senator. Uh, Louisiana is interesting. You know, the prior governor and the and the state board had approved an appeal mechanism for English language learners. The new governor came in and just got rid of it. Uh, new York, which has the regents exams, and you heard from AJ about the work of the consortium. I uh, put another play, I, I worked with the consortium for from the beginning. Uh, and its its system is quite and taught in a consortium school and administered the performance based assessments. And I will tell you that they are vastly superior to anything the Regents has to offer. Um, there was a blue ribbon commission in New York is weird. The legislature has no control at all. Um, uh, so the decisions about testing fall to the Board of Regents, um, which is an independent board that is sits at the pleasure of the state assembly, essentially. Um, there is a panel, a blue ribbon commission that put out a recommendation that said, you know what, we need other mechanisms to determine whether or not kids uh, should be graduating and what the skills they're developing and alternatives to the regents, but nothing has actually happened. And the problem is the state has relied on the regents for so long that to create something new and to actually implement something like performance assessment beyond the 30 plus schools that currently do it raises issues of capacity and, and of funding. And so it is, it, is a, it, is, it is a naughty problem, even in a state where at the highest levels, there is a push against the standardized test. I just wanna alert the group to a couple of other things that are out there in the landscape. Uh, Interim or formative assessments, maybe some of you in, in Massachusetts have encountered NWEA formative exams. This is a brand of off-the-shelf exam that is supposed to be helpful for teachers because it gives teachers more immediate information. But the truth of the matter is this may be worse than the summative tests because they are off-the-shelf tests produced by standardized testing companies, and they actually eat up more time. Um, and teachers, I was at an NEA conference uh, in, earlier in, in, the, uh, in the winter, and the number one complaint of teachers that I heard was that the interim assessments are eating into their time, that they have test after test after test. Now, this is divorced from the problem of the graduation exam, but it's, so don't think because there are no high stakes consequences attached that the, 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 the system will not still be flooded by tests. Um, and finally, in Texas, there's an interesting uh, issue regarding uh, AI scoring of essays on the STAR, which is the Texas version of the MCATs. Uh, and when they brought in the AI, 79% of students got scored by, they, they, they got a zero where the year before, um, that number was, you know, a third of that percentage. And so there's a lot of back and forth between concerned advocates and the state uh, Texas authorities. Um, I know we're running out of time, but just, you know, here are just some things that some other states are doing that are different from, um, or in addition to, in Ohio's case, uh, state standardized test, not just course completion, demonstrating competency through other lots of different mechanisms. And also they're giving these readiness seals uh, where a student can pick two or three uh, different things that they are good at and, and show achievement. Uh, New Mexico is an interesting state because they've basically blown everything up. They've gotten rid of their state test and because kids were just not graduating and not coming to school. And so there are lots of different local options you know, the MCAIA performance assessments would fit into the New Mexico local demonstration of competency or uh, portfolio-based projects that New Mexico has uh, as options for its, its local um, graduation requirements. So as state graduation requirements. So, you know, I think there's a lot of energy out there to find different things 
And I think it's great that Massachusetts does have this grassroots that de uh, developed option that that Dan has talked about uh, that can that it can be done by and with teachers at the local level with professional development and support that sort of models what's happened in New York. And we're seeing that bubbling up in a lot of other states. I could have talked about Kentucky uh, a lot because uh, they have this very interesting local United We Learn model that is that has state support, although subject to the whims of politics, you know, with uh, one state, the, 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 the architect of this, who was the commissioner, just left because he couldn't deal with the political pressure, but they still have a, Bashir is still the governor. Um, so, you know, that's, there are a lot of state specific political issues that impact the assessment question. Okay, thank you, Harry. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan, I don't know whether we have the congressman with us yet. Um, if not, no, we- you No, know, he popped in briefly and went away. So we're puzzled. Okay. Um, should we do some questions and to we wait? Pops sure. back? Um, anybody have a question for either Harry or Carol? Testing or money? <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the money of testing. It eats up a lot. Uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Barkdall. Wow. Jeffrey Barkdall. Unmute Jeffrey. There you go. Jeffrey, you're unmuted, I'm, but I'm we here. can't hear you. I'm okay, here. now we can. Good. I'm here. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I sorry. I have I. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Okay, you know Congress control. You know Congress is the one that controls our fund funding, not the president. President, so how are we gonna, so how are we gonna fix the education system when they, when they control when that when Congress controls the funding and not the president? A good question. Ideas. I I I I can only I, I can't answer that question directly, but I think that uh, Massachusetts, there is little if no conversation that goes on in the development of the budget uh, since I've been in the legislature that references anything regarding the federal mm -hmm. uh, the federal portion of what our spending looks like. It's probably buried in there somewhere, but most of those resources come to the state through grants and other indirect ways so that they're not that it's not money it's money that we take into consideration, but it's not money that's reflected in the budget that we are presented with uh, in the overall and particularly uh, for the public education budget. We we develop that budget around what we, except for the downturn in uh, revenues as we have experienced during this year. We had a happy note to say that we met, uh, if not exceeded our revenue expectation recently uh, in this last accounting, but, um, the budget is built on what we consider to be basically concrete expectations in terms of resources uh, to fund the entire budget. So, so I wonder to what extent, Carol, do legislators go to the um, members of Congress from Massachusetts and say, "Hey, we need more money. We can't can't carry the whole weight here," or so, do you just leave it to other people to do that? And not, and, uh, yeah, not to my knowledge, and I think that what the governor's office is what we're going to the feds for, particularly the president, and in this case, the president is more money to help to support the ex the huge expenditure that we are experiencing around the influx of migrants into the Commonwealth, uh, and uh, the federal government is not responding. Uh, mm -hmm. to that, so, mm -hmm. I remember. Many years ago, my wife, when my wife was a state representative, she was on the lowest status committee, which was state and federal, which was federal assistance. So the legislature, at least in those days, didn't put a very high priority on getting more out of the federal government. Yeah, same, same, same. Which is maybe a mistake. Yeah. Since, uh, you know, just as money is in the banks, 
in the in the country. Money is in the federal government. Any other questions or comments about money or testing? Uh, <clears throat> this is Cole. I think we need a pinch hitter for Representative Bowman. I'm not sure what the holdup is, but somebody should probably present his material if you can. Um, Alan, maybe you could talk, go through a little more clearly what his bill would do with respect to to the No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, you, okay. you want me to do it, Alan, or, or are you good? Or you, you want me to Somebody else wants to do it, that's fine. I don't know, go for it, go for it, if you're ready. Okay, well, fill in then, because I don't have it in tremendous detail. Um, from what I, so one of its, one provision is that it would, I believe, double or triple the amount of money going to the main federal education program, Title I. So that's one piece of it, but that's not the piece getting the most attention, and it's not the piece that's mentioned in the title. Uh, the, what the title of the bill suggests is that it will allow states to cut way back on the amount of testing that they have to do. So instead of Right now, they have to test every year from grade three through grade eight, and then again in uh, high school. Uh, and every child is supposed to be administered a test. Uh, as we always say, the child doesn't have to take the test, but the state has to administer the test or try to administer the test. Congressman Bowman's- He's uh, here. He's oh, here. I think that he's here. Okay, so let oh, me just- great. Okay. Jamal Bowman grew up in public housing and rent controlled apartments in New York City, raised by a single mother who supported her family on her post office worker salary. When he launched his underdog campaign for Congress in 2010, he was the principal of a public middle school in the Bronx that he had founded 10 years earlier. His school was built around a holistic curriculum, cultural awareness, and centering student voices. Before that, he had worked as a fourth grade teacher, so Congressman Bowman knows how federal testing mandates. Oh, get he's on. He's, he's, yeah, he's. Sorry? Keep going, Alan. Okay. How federal testing mandates get translated into the classroom. He's seen the harm that high stakes testing inflicts on children. Congressman Bowman's more, test, more teaching, less testing bill would change that. It would give states more authority to decide how often they want to test, and most important, it would allow them to use sampling instead of testing every single student, if they choose to. We're fortunate to have someone of his ability and experience to explain classroom reality to other members of Congress, members who maybe don't get it about the impact of incessant high-stakes testing on children. And we're fortunate to have him here today in this conference. It's an honor to introduce Congressman Jamal Bowman. Thank you so much, Alan, for that warm introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be with you. Uh, thank you so much to Massachusetts Peace Action and Professor Jonathan King for putting together this conference and inviting me to come speak with you. Uh, it's an honor to be here, especially in the company of so many of the incredible panelists who are taking part in today's event, some of whom I've known for quite some time. Huge shout out, especially to Diane Ravitch, Harry Fetter, Ricardo Rosa, Jeanette Dud and Jeanette Duderman. I'm so excited that this conference is happening. It's a testament to the grassroots work of so many stakeholders in public education like you who are dedicated first and foremost to our kids. And I have to say one other very special thing about Diane Ravitch. So I credit Diane for my marriage now of 10 years and my daughter, Maya, that I share with my wife. Uh, when we were dating, actually, we were just friends transitioning from the you know friend stage to dating. Uh, my then friend, uh, Melissa, gave me a book by Diane Rav Ravitch entitled the life and death of the great American school system. I hope I got that title right. And when I read it, I was uh, blown away by the book, but it was I was affirmed at many of the things I believed 
and felt intuitively about what was happening in school and what was happening to our kids. And every time I see Diane, I always tell that story so she never forgets it. So thank you, Diane. Um, as you know, I'm Congressman Bowman, representing the 16th District of New York that covers part of the Northeast Bronx and part of Southern Westchester County. Um, before I came to Congress, I was an educator for 20 years, starting out as an elementary school teacher in the South Bronx before becoming a high school guidance counselor and dean of students at the MLK High School for Arts and Technology, before becoming a middle school principal in the Northeast Bronx, where I served for 10 and a half years. I spent my entire career teaching in Title I schools in New York City with majority Black and Latino students. And so when I say majority, I mean like 99.9%. .9%. For so many of my students and their families, they couldn't even imagine the possibility of attending college because it seemed so far out of reach. For others, school was not a safe space, but a reminder of trauma for those who have been just as involved or cut up in the, caught up in the school to prison pipeline. During my time as an educator, one thing became very clear. We need a revolution in our public schools and everywhere I go, whether I'm talking to teachers or parents or students, when I'm talking about education, I use those exact words. We need a revolution in our public schools, not a revolution that calls for more charter schools or attacking teachers or banning books, but one that unlocks the unlimited potential of our kids. Our democracy and humanity depend on it. And what's so frustrating about this, as you all know, is we have the research, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we have the people to get this done. We just do not have the political will or the leadership or the vision from our leaders to get it done. And of course, we are all on this call and I ran for Congress to hopefully change that. We are the pivotal moment in our nation. We are still grappling with the effects of a global pandemic that killed millions and an ongoing mental health crisis amongst our young people, literally designated by the Surgeon General. Our children are dealing with a mental health crisis and now we have guns as the number one killer of children in our country. We all also experienced an insurrection on the United States Capitol on January 6, 2021. Lies are being peddled by powerful people like Donald Trump across the news and social media, causing facts and the truth itself to be under attack. Rapid technological advancements like AI are creating uncertainty about our futures and threatening to upend so much of our current structures with possibilities for both progress and great harm. So many of us are watching in horror as the events in Gaza continue to unfold, and we are palpably feeling the impacts here at home. Movements for economic, social, racial, and labor justice are in some ways stronger than ever, but at the same time also facing existential threats. In moments like these, I think we all know, education can and must be the answer. To quote Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful tool that can be used to change the world. And we need for all elected officials and all leaders to understand that in the core of their being. A functioning and just democracy made up of happy, healthy, and civically engaged people and communities relies on the strength of our public institutions. And first and foremost, our public education system. The push to transform our schools is not new, but for the last few decades, the answer to that push has been often, too often been charter schools, increased testing and restrictions on how and what kids can learn. We were told that if we test constantly, we would close the achievement gap, but it is clear that we need a new approach. It's finally time, finally, 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 to reimagine, redesign and reinvest in our public schools. Parents, students, educators, and communities are demanding something different. And together we can create it. We on this call have the will. We need to make sure all of our elected leaders also have the will to get it done. And we have the capacity to get it done. And we have the research to get it done. And we have the technology to get it done. And we have the resources to get it done, especially if we, we invest more in education and childcare than we do with bombs and missiles and war. 
As a lifelong educator, I was proud to introduce a bill designed to transform our education system and end the overuse, abuse, and misuse of standardized testing. I feel coming out of the opt-out movement in New York State, it was almost my calling to go to Congress and introduce this bill. My more teaching, less testing act seeks to shift our collective focus to the number one driving fo force of students' learning and well-being, the power and magic of teaching in our classrooms and our communities. For years, we have spent the majority of our time in classrooms focusing on summative standardized assessments at the end of the year. These tests were supposed to help us identify gaps in bad teachers and help the kids who needed it most. The standardized tests only highlighted what many educators already know, Lower income kids, kids from challenging circumstances and marginalized kids don't do as well, not because they aren't as intelligent or as driven as other kids, but because they and their schools are far less likely to have the resources and support they need to thrive. And not just their schools, it's their communities. It's a systematic and historic historical underfunding of marginalized communities, red line communities, underfunded housing, lack of green spaces, criminal justice entanglements, food insecurity, poverty, trauma, stress, on and on and on and on. That's why kids aren't doing well on these crappy tests that lack validity and reliability in the first place. As I just said, as I mentioned, at the same time, the standardized tests often created by private, but private industries are not truly valid or reliable. Over the years, we've wasted billions of dollars and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of time. And most importantly, the talent and passion of our kids. The longer they stay in school, the less curious they become, the less creative they become. And this is even with kids who do well on a standardized test. You know, I mentioned Diane's book, and if you haven't read it, check it out. I know probably everyone on this call read it. There's also an amazing documentary called Race to Nowhere about kids who do well in school but don't know where they're going because they haven't identified their passion and purpose. Kids aren't excited about school. Instead of them doing school, school is being done to them. Our schools should be centers of our communities, places that foster self-discovery, center the principles of holistic child development, and allow kids to find and pursue their passions. Students should be excited to go to school every day and engage with their interests. We will never be able to create that sense of excitement if we don't re-examine and adjust our focus on standardized testing. Look, when I was in school, I did well on standardized tests. So well, I was tracked into middle school classes. You know how they used to do the tracking, 7 one 8 one, nine, one et cetera. But I was bored to death in school. I was bored because I did not see myself reflected in the curriculum. And as a result of that, I got in a lot of trouble in school and out of school because school was never about me. It was always about some abstract information related to the suppression and oppression of who I was and my ancestry. And our schools can be redesigned in places that capture the imagination of kids while also capturing their cultural identity as well. Beyond that, overtesting our kids creates strains on their mental and emotional well being. As a middle school principal, I saw a dramatic increase in mental health challenges among our kids, even among students who perform well on tests. The hyper focus on standardized testing can cause or exacerbate stress and trauma, as well as prevent kids from developing holistic and a strong sense of themselves. I agree that there is a place for some high quality assessments to understand how our kids are doing, but we need a totally new approach. Students should have a breadth of opportunities and experiences during their time in school. We need to elevate and uplift project-based learning where students can turn their passions and interests into projects that demonstrate their learning across multiple fields and disciplines. We have to make investments in sports and music and the arts so that they have opportunities to express themselves and build communities outside of the classroom. We need to give them time to play and to interact with each other joyfully to build social emotional skills, find deep friendships and problem solve authentically. It is through creating these windows for creativity, self-discovery and joy that we can truly unlock our kids full potential. And oh, by the way, help them and nurture them to become problem solvers 
and engage with 21st century big challenges like climate change. That's what we have to nurture our kids towards, being their best selves and solving big problems. The More Teaching Less Testing Act creates spaces for kids to be kids and educators to do their jobs. Decreasing the required frequency of testing dramatically will still provide important data for states to strategically support our kids and to make sure kids can meet students where they are, excuse me, teachers can meet students where they are. It also invests in helping states develop innovative forms of assessment that more accurately represent the wide variety of skills, knowledge, and dispositions that are important for a happy, healthy life. And it reduces reliance on the results of assessments and some of the most important high stakes decisions made in school settings, such as whether or not a student will graduate or how a teacher is evaluated. We still have, can you believe this, in some schools in this country, in New York City, New York State, kids being held back in elementary school due to test scores, even though all of the research tells us it's the worst thing to do is hold a kid back in elementary school. As we know, intelligence is diverse. Our world and our society are not linear. Skills for success in critical thinking can't always be bubbled in on a test or measured by a singular number. Students deserve a broad and well-rounded environment and to learn instruments, perform in plays, participate on sports teams, and explore their passion to find their purpose. And oh, by the way, especially if you're in a warm climate, take kids outside to learn. Get them out of the square box school building. Many of them feel like jail cells just by the way they're designed. Take kids outside so they can breathe and understand nature. Intelligence is infinite, and education should open the door to our infinite possibilities. Our bill acknowledges that and gives kids the opportunity to create creatively problem solve, build new designs, and answer, ask and answer life's, life's toughest questions. To truly create these opportunities, we also have to make bold investments in our education system so that kids have the people, communities, and facilities that they need to thrive. Instead of blank checks for bombs and unlimited funding for weapons of war, we have to prioritize our young people. Last year, as Congress was considering the National Defense Authorization Act, I introduced an amendment to reinvest $157 billion from our defense budget into our public education and child care systems. We are willing to spend billions upon billions of dollars to militarize and criminalize, but many of my colleagues are unwilling to make the same investments in our public schools. Public education is in many ways a national security issue. Not in many ways, it is a national security issue. And if we get it right, we're gonna see uh, prison costs go down, healthcare costs go down, and we'll spend less on our military. It is foundational to a democracy and society that promotes peace at home and abroad. And that is grounded first and foremost in our shared humanity. Our ongoing crisis in education requires massive investments that we can clearly afford. We just need to have the courage to make them. And imagine this, when we invest in education, imagine what our kids are gonna put back into the economy because they've received, received an exemplary education. With the $157 billion that my amendment would have redirected to public education, we could fully fund Head Start for every child in poverty. That would mean better learning outcomes for our kids and millions of parents and families able to enter or stay in the workforce. We could fully fund IDEA, quadruple Title I funding, invest in our teaching workforce, provide wraparound mental health services to our kids, and rebuild our, public, our crumbling public schools. Oh, by the way, we call that the Green New Deal for public schools. Please look it up if you haven't uh, become aware of it. My amendment didn't even get a vote because most of my colleagues in Congress have no experience in education and no real expertise on what's happening in our schools. But I live the reality in classrooms and communities. I'm here to have an honest conversation about what is really necessary to support our kids, save our democracy, and transform our world. When we're honest with ourselves about what's really happening in our communities, the answer is clear. We need an education stimulus on a never before seen scale. I'm a proud champion. I'm proud to champion those investments in Congress and bring my experiences to educated to my work in our government so that we can take real meaningful action to end over testing once and for all, invest in our education systems 
and uplift our kids so that all of them can unlock their full potential. Thank you so, 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 so much for having me. And thank you for your collective work you are all doing to unlock our kids' unlimited potential. And shout out to all my Massachusetts representatives like Ayanna Presley, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and so many others who are definitely aligned with us and allies in this work. So peace and love to you all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Well, that was uh, that was inspiring. We're going to move now into the breakouts. Um, Glenn, you want to give people a little um, how it's going to happen? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this lovely conference. Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Jamal Bowman. Uh, we have breakouts. Let me get uh, what we have available for you on the screen. Here they are. Let's get that nice and visible for all of you. One moment. Breakout room A, state legislative challenges to high stakes graduation requirements. Breakout room B, resisting narrowing of curriculum and rote learning. Breakout room C, corporate influences on public education. Breakout room D, heightened impacts on students and families of color. Breakout room E, impacts on special ed and ELA students. Breakout room F, community efforts to defend public schools and libraries. Breakout room G, books not bombed, securing the budgets our school needs. Now, while this happens, we have some lovely relaxing music for all of you to get nice and relaxed as the breakout rooms are distributed. So be patient with us. Uh, Jonathan, how long should we have for each breakout room? It is 429 and I can set them to different lengths of time before people, they close automatically. Uh, why don't you send them for 40 minutes? 40 minutes. Yeah. Okay, everyone. So please be patient. Enjoy the nice aerial view of this majestic coastline as we uh, get you distributed. Thank you so much, everyone. Do we have to press any button ourselves? Yeah, once Glenn opens the rooms, you should see a button that says join, join, join breakout. I may have to disable the screen sharing, so unfortunately there will be no Vista, but we'll get you in there. You know what's interesting? I can't find the join button, even though I'm co-host. Happening soon. Okay. Uh -huh. Very good. Join. It looks like we have a few stragglers. Let's see. Okay, so now for distributing the rest of you, we'll go one by one for per breakout room and we'll make sure that you get to where you wanna go. One moment. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We only have eight people who are unassigned. So, Carol, uh, you'd like to go to breakout room A, yes? Okay. And Jessica, you want to go to breakout room G, I believe. Alan, you want to go to what breakout room? D. D, okay. Oh. Kathy? I thought I was an F, and but it, I don't think it was the right place for me. I'm supposed to be in um, the community organizing place. 
Okay, we'll get you to community organizing, community defense. I think that's breakout room F. I'm still here. You should see something sending you to F now for community defense. Okay, Kathy's good. Jessica, uh, you should go to breakout room G, I believe. Okay, Jessica is in breakout room G. Maureen, where would you like to go? Uh, Ruth Rodriguez phase group. I, I signed up with that, the ELL learners. Okay. So that would have been uh, E, impact on special ed and ELA students. I will now get you to E. Okay. August, um, what room would you like to go to? Room B, please. Room B. Let's get you there. Okay, you have been invited to room B. Darnell, what room would you like to go to? D. D it is. You have been invited to room D. Susan, what room would you like to go to? Um, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think I was assigned to G, but I couldn't figure out how to get there. I'll get you when I go to G. It's booked snot bombs. Yeah, okay. You have been invited to room G. Andrew, what room would you like to go to? I think the remaining people have stepped away from their computers, probably. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Katerina. Is the reason is that right? I would like to go to room A, please. I had pre registered for that. You will now be given to room A. Thank you. Okay, you've been invited to room A. Amy, Ellen, Andrew, uh, any concerns? Sounds like you're good. Okay. Yeah, they've been invited to room, but they haven't accepted it yet. So they may. They, okay. There's always a slight chance that somebody may join the the Zoom meeting, you know, in, in the next forty minutes. So. Yep. So they'll appear here. Okay, that wasn't as messy as it could have been. So. Yeah, yeah it went all right. Okay, um, we're still being broadcast live to YouTube. Uh, should yeah, I... we should probably stop that, and if you can remember to start again after. Yep. Got yeah, yeah. This isn't very useful on YouTube right now. Things are going good.